Okay, uh, my name is Tom Hagen. I've been a SARA member since about 2009 or 2010. And uh, <clears throat> Dave Benham got me interested in this, and as quite a few of you know, he passed away several years ago, but we're continuing the tradition here. Um, just a, a word about our clubhouse here. Uh, this is the uh, McMath Hulbert Solar Observatory in Lake Angeles, Michigan, and this is where we do our radio astronomy projects. It's a uh, decommissioned solar observatory that was originally started and run by the University of Michigan, uh, decommissioned in 1980. It's in private ownership now, and the owner allows us to uh, hang out out here. The, uh, there are different uh, instruments and telescopes. There aren't any real uh, typical optical telescopes here. These are all instruments like spectroheliscopes and spectrometers and so on to look at solar spectra. The title of my talk is Building Antennas <coughs> and Using SDRs to Detect H1 and Continuum at 1.424 blah 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 gigahertz. I, uh, I'm just getting started in this as uh, as an activity. I, the past few years I've been working mostly in the VLF range, so the goal of this project is for uh, me to build something or another that can detect the H1 wavelength from the celestial objects in the sky. I've never done that before. I mean, I've used the 40-foot dish here, but that's been pretty much the extent of my experience so as part of this learning process, I, I found I needed to learn about thermal emission, which is a very, very important concept in radio astronomy. I needed to learn about radio telescopes, too. I, I know a fair amount about antennas and so on from my day job, but uh, there's an awful lot of information that's unique to radio astronomy that I don't understand. I had to learn about the difference between total power measurements or continuum measurements and spectrometry. And in the H1 band, there's an important emission line from cold hydrogen. I had to learn about SDR receivers, and there's, this is an enormous area for me uh, to learn about. The learning curve here is just tremendous. I had to learn about signal processing, and I'm still learning. I'm, I'm really just getting started. Um, so what I did was I built and tested a first guess horn setup, and we started the construction of a 10-foot dish antenna at MHO. I've also uh, helped Skip out with his interferometer. With uh, I built up a six-foot dish that will act as one half of an interferometer with the 40-foot telescope. So uh, why bother with this anyway? Well, of course, the answer is I've been doing uh, VLF mostly the past few years, so decided to divide my wavelength by what? About 100,000 to go from 21 kilometers to 21 centimeters. Math? Math check? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, of course, because it's there. I do this instead of climbing Mount Everest, I guess. <laughs> you guys watched to see the movie uh, Everest, anybody? Yeah. That was pretty spectacular. Um, and of course, 1.4 gigahertz is extremely popular in the amateur radio field, too. So I want to get in on the action a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> It's, uh, I find radio astronomy for me is definitely a hands-on experience. I like to build stuff first. I like to start with things I can literally build with my hands and then learn as I go. I'm not so hot on book learning just um, because I, I need to tie it in with something uh, a little more real, I guess, material. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, well, let's talk a little bit about thermal emission. Any body that has a temperature body meaning object, physical object that has a temperature above absolute zero radiates on many, many wavelengths. And this is caused by the acceleration of the charges in the molecules and atoms of this material body. When they are accelerated, they are accelerated, accelerated at many different energy levels. So basically there's a, a, a continuous 
wavelength emitted by objects that have a temperature. There is this object called the black body simulation chamber that quite often when you read about radio astronomy, you'll see that this is used to explain back black body radiation. This is what the uh, initial studies were done with in the 19th century. They would heat up the inside of the chamber to where it was actually glowing in the optical range, and then they'd use a uh, spectroscope or a, some, some kind of a device to measure the actual brightness. And they found that the brightness varies due, uh, with temperature according to what's called the black body radiation curve. This curve is how radio astronomers uh, can measure the objects, temperature of objects in the sky. Basically, it's like looking at an object and looking at its color at a particular wavelength. Of course, color can extend far on either side out of the optical range down into the radial range, which means really wavelength. So there's <coughs> this unit called radiance or brightness or spectral intensity, it has several different names. These are the actual units in the uh, MKS system. It's joules per second per meter squared per hertz per steer radian. And the meter squared corresponds to the effective area of your antenna or receiving device. The steer radians is the area of whatever it is you're looking at in the sky. So this is uh, basically watts per hertz per meter squared per steer radian. So it comes out on the log-log plot, it looks like this. If you have frequency here on the horizontal axis and brightness on the vertical axis, you get this section where the lines are, are, are almost, they look straight. And this primarily is where radio astronomers work. So the neat thing about this is that you can, for a given wavelength or frequency, let's say, one terahertz or whatever that is, thousand gigahertz, if you detect the brightness of your object as this brightness here, you can just go to this curve and you can say what, what you're looking at is at 300 Kelvin. And it took, this is, for me, it was not a, a real intuitive concept, but I think it's something you have to understand before you go very far in uh, radio astronomy. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, it's like the, uh, the color that you see from a, an object that's heated hot enough to glow in the optical range. So if you have a piece of steel in an oven at 550 degrees Celsius, it looks, it's this color. And as you get up to 1300, it becomes almost yellow hot or white hot. This thing's conking out on me. Does anybody have a... Yeah. Another one? Oh, wait a minute. There it is. Um, so as you can see, this is, I think this, everybody kind of recognizes this, but this is kind of how radio astronomers detect brightness of objects in the sky, by the color or wavelengths or frequency. So these are the uh, equations that govern the uh, brightness curves and uh, the equation called the Rayleigh's gene approximation. And this is the one we use in radio astronomy because this is the one that describes the, the straight lines on the uh, brightness curve. The, uh, and this is basically useful up to about 100 gigahertz maybe, something like that. And that's, that's the typical maximum frequency of uh, telescopes here on Earth. I guess they're getting a little higher than that now, so. They would have to account for that. So anyway, in summary of thermal emission, the, uh, the temperature of a distant object can be found by looking at its radiance. And if you know the radiance and the frequency, you can determine its temperature. Radio telescopes work in the lower part of the black body curve. It's called the Rayleigh genes approximation. Uh, radio astronomers relate the radiance or surface brightness to the temperature with the Rayleigh genes approximation. 
And radio astronomers even use brightness temperature to refer to radiation that's not thermal in nature. So, uh, for example, synchrotron radiation from electrons traveling along magnetic field lines in our galaxy at the, in the frequencies of tens of megahertz will actually look much brighter. It will indicate a much higher temperature than you would get if you're just looking at pure thermal radiation from the galaxy. Yeah, 408, it's almost all synchrotron radiation. Is it? See. Yeah. I, I understand that the galaxy is brightest around what, 20 to 50 megahertz? And that's why, that's why Jansky got lucky, because he was, he was on 20 megahertz, which is where the galaxy is super bright. Yeah. Yeah. Back then, they thought all astronomical objects radiated thermally by the thermal radiation mechanism. H1 is an important emission uh, line. It's actually a single line of a discrete frequency of wavelength of 21 centimeters, or 1.42 gigahertz approximately. And uh, there's a TBD in there, sorry about that. Uh, the uh, one in an individual hydrogen atom, when the uh, magnetic moments are aligned, that's the high energy state. And then when they flip to the opposite state, uh, that's the low energy state. So we have a, a basically a photon is emitted when this happens at 21 centimeters wavelength. Now this is, uh, the half-life on this thing is incredibly slow. I understand it, it happens like on a, just one every million years or two years, is it? 10 million. 10 million. Yeah. But since there's so much hydrogen out there, you uh, see it all the time. That's the chance for any one half. Yeah, so what is it, one, one hydrogen atom per cubic centimeter or something like that out there? Yeah. That's a lot of cubic centimeters, I think, in the galaxy. So anyway, um, to detect H1, we use a narrow bandwidth on our receiver, our IF bandwidth, basically tens of kilohertz through maybe one megahertz or something like that, as I understand it. I think the 40-footer uses 100K bandwidth when we're doing spectral work. Skip. 10. Okay. So anyway, let's build something. Um, so I decided to start with a horn, and there was a, there's a nice design out there by uh, Paul Shook. Um, and he, I guess Paul based his on the UN design. Everybody's seen that out there. Preston, you said you had uh, insect problems with yours. Is Preston, yeah. Um, left in I think door. two years ago there was this huge hornet nest in there. Did <coughs> everybody see that? There. It's there? There's other joke. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> there's a hornet there. There's a ball in there. Yeah. <laughs> People must think it's a giant trash can or something, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, this horn was one of the most, I mean, the, this, they, this was used to discover the original H1 emission line. And, uh, Ewan's advisor, I guess, won the Nobel Prize for it, right? Yeah, I think that's when the Nobel Prize was something else. Oh. It was still pretty good. Yeah, okay, okay. I thought it was for this, okay. No, I stand else, corrected. Still pretty good. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, Paul calls it, calls it the horn of plenty, which I means you get plenty of signal or something like that. Huh? <laughs> so anyway, I went to my local Home Depot and I started cutting sheet metal here and I got some aluminum angle. You can see the screws along the sides here to uh, hold it together. And it's pretty, pretty loosey-goosey until you get, the, get all four sides put together. And then it, it tends to go out of square. But uh, we took care of that problem with uh, this <coughs> aluminum angle frame, like a picture frame around the front. And that, that really did the trick to stiffen it up. So if you build one of these, you know, I would recommend doing it this way. The only problem here is that you have to do, you have to deal with compound angles because the uh, sides of the horn are sloping and then you have, of course, the 45 degree angle at the corners. So that took a little bit of doing. Ed Hendry, our, the guy, our, one of our volunteers at MH, <coughs> loves to build stuff. And uh, he rigged up this, uh, what do you call this thing, a, a template? 
jig. Out of wood, a jig out of wood. He, he held the, uh, the uh, angles in there and he ran them through our table saw, which has carbide tip on the blade, which didn't seem to dull it very much. So that, and yeah, like I say, once we did that, he was pretty stiff. And then I decided, in, a po a, I took a little bit further from uh, Paul's design. I decided to add a little waveguide stub on the back. I went on the web and found out the calculations, <coughs> excuse me, for the uh, dimensions and all on it. And uh, I built that and I we tacked that on the back. It's going to make it a little bit harder to uh, operate as an alt as, which is what I want to do because the extension there is going to give me some interference with my base, but we'll have to deal with that later. All right. Oh, nice. Okay. So uh, here it is with my uh, preamp attached. That's a uh, G4 DDK preamp. And uh, I checked it out last night Charles with, on Charles' setup. And the noise figure is a little higher than what I remembered. I, as I recall when I checked it the first time, it was about 0.4 dB. 0.4 dB with 32 dB gain. And now it's running around 1 dB. So I'm, I've got two more of these kits. I'm going to build, build them up. I did do one thing. I substituted the front end transistor. I found what would look like a lower noise transistor than the original design called for. Um, I don't know if that would have much to do with it as long as I bias it properly. It should be okay. But the uh, I used a short length RT400 and then here's the output here. That goes to my uh, receiver. So, uh, of course, in Michigan, you, you don't point a horn straight up and uh, expect good results. <laughs> well, it's a nice dose of snow. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I didn't uh, do anything fancy like checking this stuff in the microwave like Preston did. I just got some window film and put it up, stuck it on there, shrunk it with a heat gun, and went to, went to see what happened. And it was just, it was good because we got our first snowfall in November after I finished it last fall. So, but I did sweep the snow up before trying to get results. And then uh, <clears throat> here's somebody uh, operating uh, the receiver. We used uh, just an RTL SDR. He's, he has a beard too. I don't know what happened. Huh? Santa. Santa. <laughs> Santa Claus. We're using, uh, we started off with uh, GNU, uh, the GNU radio interface. This was, uh, this was Marcus Leach's radio, uh, GNU radio setup. Well, simple RA, that's right, that's what it was. Wolfgang Herman has this uh, live minute, live Linux Live, Linux Mint Live USB uh, ISO file that you can download. First time I tried it, it was corrupt and he reloaded it up again and I downloaded it and it worked the second time. Bless his heart. And uh, we uh, just went through and picked some settings in there and uh, did, took some data and We'll see what happened uh, later in the presentation. I'll show you what we found. Um, now, uh, the feature plans are to put this onto an alt as mount, as pictured here. Does anybody recognize this? Is that your goal? Yeah. Bell Labs telescope used for the 3D Reese gate measurements. That's kind of a neat idea. I know we might try something like that. I don't know. I don't know much smaller scale ups. Except that, wait a minute, his horn is goes out at a 90 degree angle. Compared yeah, to ours. That's horn reflector. Yeah, yeah. There's one on the old butt then. Yeah, that's right. It's free protected. They used to put them on the uh, uh, relay towers yeah. for the microwaves. Yeah, you used to see these all, all over the place. I don't know, 20 years ago, maybe up to. They were exceptionally low side loads because it was needed for the microwave. Oh, links, and that's why it worked out so good for the 3 d Oh, okay, so they had no ground problems. Yeah, for microwave links, they were uh, vertical. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. Or what? I mean, we had both polarities. Yeah. But the, yes, the antenna was mounted vertically. Uh, but I'm going to argue with the side load. We had what we call the side edge blinders on them to get rid of side load issues. So there's. 
you see in the living rooms, you see a uh, side edge, little scalp uh, line down the side, and then they've made to put bottom edge blinders because they had a foreground problem. A foreground thing to reflect off the ground and use the antenna. There's yeah. thousands of them out there. The Still? Yeah. Because they, they're too, too expensive to take off the tower. Oh, they're just sitting there, not they're used. Sitting there. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there'd be a good Sarah project. Snag one of these. And <laughs> Promise one for everybody. Door prize next year. <laughs> Just got to go get it. Uh, okay. So anyway, that's the that was uh, what I did last year regarding the horn development, and uh, so I thought I would go to a dish and. Uh, this is my first dish. With is that a kind of filter? <laughs> <laughs> we were kind of hoping maybe one of the old timers could tell us why we didn't get so, such good results with this. Anger issues. This is not Red Cap's fault either. You know, you, you might think that because he's involved here. Roofers. Yeah. <laughs> he got run over by a truck. We had this thing sitting what we thought out was out of the line of fire, and uh, they were putting a new roof on our building, and they backed into it and shoved it up against a tree or something. I don't know what happened. The tree didn't survive either. No. Little bombs. Everybody lost it. <laughs> so anyway, we got lucky last year at the Ham Fest 2015. Uh, local guy Jack Walker, WATN of Ann Arbor. Michigan had an old C-band dish that he he's, he's, he's had out there for years and hasn't been used and uh, He's getting ready to sell his house and he needs to get this stuff out of there. So he uh, he offered it to us and we we accepted the uh, Donation so we got that thing up. Here's here is, is sitting on the ground at his house and we had to Borrow a pickup truck to take this thing apart and get it up to uh, MHO and when we uh, <clears throat> we looked at it, we found that we could adapt the uh, mount. This uh, this mount is uh, allows the dish to move in right ascension, I guess, plus or minus whatever tilt from the equator on what your latitude is. We flipped it 90 degrees, just like I believe Preston did, and uh, we're using it now in right ascension. We're going to use it as a transit instrument. Ed Hendry, again, our uh, our master builder, um, fixed up this uh, protractor thing out of a piece of aluminum. We have a, a set screw here that allows us to uh, to move it back and forth. This thing has excellent brass bearings. It's, it's really solid steel, and it's it's really a, a beautiful mechanism. And like I say, we're able to modify it and get get it to work for us as a transit instrument and uh, here's Ed again working on it and uh, he's there's eventually well, there will be a brake locking screw I've got another picture of it mounted on the post there so you can get a better view of that when we're finished um, the next thing is a feed horn the <clears throat> everything I've read on the line says to get a two pound coffee can so I got a two pound coffee can here and uh, <laughs> yeah, <it's aluminum. laughs> so I started looking around. I found that then I found uh, at yeah, my local Gardens Bulk Food Supply, I found some ketchup in a can of the right size. There's about seven pounds of ketchup in here, so I figured, you know, nine years later, I'd have my feet horn after I get through that much ketchup. <laughs> so uh, I thought, good, there's still 10. Number 10 tin cans available out there. So uh, I talked to the manager of our cafeteria, and we, we go through many, many tin, number 10 tin cans per week just in our cafeteria. You see, this is one week's worth of uh, cans here. So he says, you can have as many as you want. OK. So now I can build many feed horns. I, uh, I picked a feed horn, and I looked up on the web to see what the, how to build one of these things. So I just built it according to spec instructions. And here it is, sitting on my bench. You can see the little feed in there. It's a couple of inches long or whatever. And it's spaced about a quarter of a wavelength, I think, from the back of the can. 
this is amazing. Something this simple that, that how well it works, I guess. It must have something to do with the fact that it is so simple that it works so well. I don't know. One of those deals. Um, I uh, hook it up to my uh, network analyzer. And uh, I'm getting about a VSWR of 1.2 at uh, 1.4 gigahertz here. So it's a pretty good match. So I was happy to see that. And uh, the next thing on our 10 foot dish was to uh, come up with a uh, support for it. We had this uh, 13 foot pipe lying around at MHO. We have all sorts of interesting things available to us that have just been sitting around for years that haven't been scrapped yet. And we, this 13 foot pipe fits perfectly the, uh, the uh, mount, it's the right diameter and everything. And it's about the right length too. So uh, here's somebody again working on the hole. We dug this thing about seven feet deep. It's Ken's better site, I like to say. He's got red on. I know it's a shot. Give him the shoot. So we uh, we put the, we we dug this seven foot hole. We put concrete at the base. We set the pole in. I, we should have done uh, the uh, rebar across the bottom like Preston did, but it didn't occur to us at the time, so it's a done deal now. Um, and then here we are with the uh, MHO volunteer crew. There's three or four of us who come out, and uh, so we've got the thing mounted. And this is basically where we, where we are today. We don't have the, uh, the feed mounted yet on it. Um, I learned to do some welding. My uh, motto is no bead is too great for any joint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hadn't used yeah. And uh, this thing, it balances, it. What you, the way it's set up here, it balances almost perfectly. It'll probably be a little bit off balance once we add the feed horn support arms. Um, another consideration is the uh, beam width of the horn, and uh, I haven't looked into this very much, but you know, you put a horn at the focus point, you don't know if, if, you're, uh, if your beam width is too wide. If it is, you, you pick up side lobe noise, and if it's too narrow, then you don't get full illumination. You lose efficiency on the antenna. Something to consider that, you know, go along the learning curve. My third dish. Just, just, uh, just a tip. Have you uh, looked at Paul Shook's feed horn design uh, tools? No. If they're on the web, the city site. Okay. And look for feed horn and uh, you'll find his, his tools. All right. You've got a very good set of tools to help you design that. Uh huh. Yeah, the, um, I don't know what the F ratio on that dish is. Is there a, like a common F number for these 10 no, footers? He, he okay. Okay. Then uh, I, I worked on a third dish, or well, actually we did as a group, and uh, this one ended up down here. The uh, original feed horn for the 10-foot got hijacked, and this on this six-foot dish now. This is a, another dish we had just lying around at MHO, um, and uh, it was quite an ordeal to get it here. Um, Basically, I met Skip at the Dayton Hamvention this year. So you can see where I started in Lake Angeles, Michigan. And then we took this thing physically. We lifted the whole thing off my car, set it onto his car, including the, uh, the rack mounts. Which is everywhere. Yeah. And then Skip took it out on the highway. I followed him for a few miles and nothing fell off. So <laughs> Skip deemed it appropriate for the for the 350 mile trip from uh, Dayton to, to here. And uh, you saw the result of it in Skip's presentation. Um, the other uh, major learning curve item for me is software to find radio. It's not Süddeutsche Rundfunk either. It's the uh, software. Yeah, software-defined radio. Um, 
I decided to work with GNU Radio, which uh, runs under Linux, and I chose Ubuntu because it seems, I've fooled around with Ubuntu a little bit, and it seems very easy to, to work with, to install, and so on. It works like a lot like Windows, too, which I like, since I've been working with Windows for decades now. Um, GNU Radio is an interesting thing, too. It's pretty involved. There's uh, basically what you do, if you use it in its native format, you actually write Python code to do whatever you want, and it communicates over the USB bus to uh, SDR of many types. It's, it's quite versatile. Um, so, uh, and I also like Marcus Leach's Simple RA. I know very little about it yet, but I'm, I'm starting to use it. And uh, getting that to work with, um, what was the problem we had? Oh, it was with the uh, hack RF. You need what's called an out of tree source that can, is basically is the driver for this um, Michael Osman's uh, radio. The, uh, so anyway, I mean, you, the first thing you try is standard Ubuntu uh, method, which is called apt-get. You just type that in, and you, you type in the name, and it does everything for you. But uh, this is not listed in that directory. You can get GNU Radio, but it's, a, it's the wrong version. It doesn't contain the uh, Osmocom SDR out of source tree that you need to run uh, Michael Osmond's radio. There's, there are a number of different methods, as I discovered, to install software. There's one called PyBombs that uh, somebody had recommended. I couldn't get it to work. Uh, GitHub, I tried that. I couldn't get it to work very well. And then there's the uh, tar.gc, the uh, uh, compressed file um, method that I'm not familiar enough to use. But I finally found, uh, go through my... Uh, Things here. I've, the uh, the one that I was able to get to work was one called Personal Package Archive, and somebody had taken the Osmocom SDR out of source tree and, and had bundled it in with GNU Radio, and uh, I was able to get it to run that way. Um, so I actually got some results. This was back last fall with the horn. And I got something that could be diurnal variation of total power. So it looks like it's this is running for six or seven days worth. And so every night something would go over and possibly the uh, galactic plane. Um, close up, a couple of days. Anyway, future steps. Um, we'd like to finish the 10 foot dish this summer and start collecting data. Um, I like to do, understand basically better how to do uh, antenna noise, to system noise temperature, so I can estimate the sensitivity of my my systems. Um, better pointing technique for the horn. I'd like to try a Dickey receiver. I know people in, in the group have tried these, and uh, they seem to work pretty well. And uh, we had trouble running simple RA uh, to get all the plotting functions, but uh, since I did this slide here, I've been working with Bogdan, and Bogdan came up with a, uh, a method, Bogdan, oh there he is, a uh, method to uh, run um, everything off of two live USB sticks, and the second stick, correct me if I'm wrong here, is used to store the data, so that if you have this thing out of remote site logging and the power goes out or something crashes, you don't lose all your data this way. So that's, I brought a uh, laptop with the, with the two sticks, and uh, I hope to have it set up in the lounge tonight so we can have a look at it. But thanks to Bogman for that. And uh, <clears throat> I guess that's it. It's over! <laughs> Thank you.
Yes. So if anybody wants to do the same thing that, that Tom did, I put the uh, project on GitHub. So, yeah. Uh, we can get you, you can email me or you can email Tom, uh, and we can send you the links to the GitHub project that has the instructions, and you can just kind of follow the rules step by step. And get your own. Yeah, I've done it a number of times, and it's worked for me pretty well. Pretty well. The only thing I found was that my laptop seems to be fussy about which two ports I use for the two sticks. I just kind of discovered that by accident. Um, so uh, now we have, uh, for any impromptu presentations, we have a, a little more time here. Yes? Hopefully I would each like to have just a little bit of time to show us what we did last night. Okay. Okay. <coughs> And Bob, Robert? You went to a lot of trouble to build that nice looking horn. Mm -hmm. Why did you abandon it in favor of the dish? Well, it's a parallel project. Pardon? It's a parallel project. Oh. Uh, so. It's just a so it I would have found it difficult to stop working on the horn when I got as far along as you did. Okay, well, it's, that's the difference between you and me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'll come back to it. Yeah, which SDR radio were you using? Uh, you using? This one was the RTL SDR that we got the data for. Uh, okay. And, and uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't claim that it's anything, but it, it looks like it could be diurnal variation to me. Mm -hmm. Galactic plane, I guess, most likely. Uh, so, um, Gary, yes, Robert. One more question. I have no idea what the answer to this is. What is the difference in gain between that uh, horn that you built and the dish you have? Well, you look at the effective area, I think would be the way to do it. And the, uh, the, the effective area of a dish is approximately the, you know, the area so of the dish. It's a little smaller than the diameter because you have loss on the edge illumination. Okay. So 60% uh, so of the area is Okay. Reasonable to get. Things like GBT get 70%. Oh, which is a good design, obviously. Which is very good. Yeah. Uh, whereas a horn, you run very close to 100%. In other words, you measure that area on the front, you're getting almost all of it. Horns tend to run cleaner paddles, but uh, yeah. it's a lot less area you're picking up with. Yeah. I don't know, but what's the illumination on a horn? Is it close to 100% of the. Uh, uh, it runs pretty close to it. Okay. I know they do use these horns for reference measurements because of yeah, the well, they're calculable. Yeah. You know, if you take a horn and just very carefully build it uh -huh. and uh, run through relatively simple amount of calculations and you can say what gain is and you'll be pretty close. Yeah. Whereas on a dish you have things like, well, what is the illumination taper at the edge and is it consistent everywhere? And there's too many unknowns to know the exact gain. Yeah. Okay. Um,